Western Airlines Flight 39 left Salt Lake City at midnight Christmas night, southbound for Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Because of the surface wind conditions, pilot Ben Laubacher brought her in high over the San Gabriel Mountains. He was cruising at 14,000 feet over Fontana at 2.40 a.m. when he made his first contact with the Los Angeles International Airport. L.A. Tower from Western 39. L.A. Tower from Western 39. This is L.A. Tower. Come in, Western 39. This is Western 39 reporting at 14,000 over Fontana and requesting landing instructions. Over. Hello, Western 39. You're clear to land on runway 25. Wind, northeast, gusty. Thank you, L.A. Say, that's quite a fire you have down there. What fire? Well, there's a whole mountain burning up the coast ways. I guess somewhere back to Point Doom. I hadn't heard anything about it. Well, take a look out the tower window. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it from here. Yeah, I'd better report that. Yeah, that you had, boy. Donna Cruz was fairly new at her job. She joined the Los Angeles board operator and dispatcher on October 1st. Early in the morning of December 26th, she was the only operator on duty at the Malibu fire station of Agura in the San Fernando Valley, some 45 miles west of Los Angeles. At 2.40 a.m., her switchboard lit up like the Christmas tree she had turned off before leaving for work a few hours ago. Fire department, Malibu station. I want to report fire. Yes, sir. Where is it? Well, I don't know exactly, but from where I am, it seems to be up Zuma Canyon. Thank you, sir. Looks like the whole mountain top's on fire. Yes, we'll You've take care of it. Excuse me, please. Station. I have another call. Malibu Fire Station. Headquarters. We have a report from an airplane of a fire back at Point Doom. Yes, I already have it. Okay, Malibu. Battalion Chief Malibu George Reichert came in from the yes. kitchen with a pot of fresh coffee yes, to find you. Donna with more calls than she could handle. Malibu Fire He slipped into the chair beside her and took the next one. Malibu Fire Station, Chief Reichert. Now, this is over that canyon station. We can see a fire over in your territory. Where in our territory? Appears to be about five miles west of Saddle Peak Lookout. Thank you, Seller Dad. We'll check. From an airplane three miles above the earth, from a citizen on the ground, from a fire station 20 miles away, a rough sort of triangulation is possible. The warning bell. The alert signal that a dispatch is coming through. By the time the battalion chief has picked up the receiver, the men are awake, wriggling into their gear and scrambling toward their stations on the engine. Roll to a reported brush fire in the Newton Canyon area. And they roll. Engine 71 from the Zuma Station on Pacific Highway. Number 88 from the Malibu Beach Colony. Number 70 from Las Flores Canyon. 72 from Wachusa. And from across the mountains in Calabasas, number 67. Ripping the stillness of the night after Christmas with the shrill terror of their sirens. The ranchers, the homeowners, the farmers come awake with the start as they hear them scream by. For they live with the fear of fire in these crisp and dusty hills. At 3.40 a.m., one hour after the fire was reported, 23 engine companies, three bulldozers, five work crews, and four patrol units. 170 men are fighting the fire, and the fire is winning. Crackling down the mountainsides, roaring through the canyons, whipped by a 50-mile-an-hour wind, forcing back men and machines, backwards and downwards toward the wide beaches and the sea, which surely must stop it. There was no dawn along the beach the day after Christmas. The swirling black smoke merely became gray. And when the stinging hot wind whipped it thin from time to time, toward the east, a bloody ball hung momentarily at the mountain's rim, where men yesterday had seen the sun. Frank L. Dickover, Jr. had driven his wife and nine-month-old daughter to safety. And now he was returning to his home in Zuma Canyon to do what he could to save them, but he never got there. Smoke, thicker than any beach fog, engulfed his car, blinding him. After the fire had roared by, the highway patrol found the wreck, and nearby, Mr. Dickover's charred body. He'd broken his leg when the car went off the road. He didn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. 
That first morning, County Fire Chief Keith Klinger set up his command post at the Zuma Fire Station on the Pacific Coast Highway. His command now comprised 430 men, including Navy and Marine personnel, moved in by truck from the CV base at Port Wanimi in Terminal Island. In the firehouse, where the gleaming engines usually stand, gray ladies of the Red Cross served coffee and sandwiches to smoke blackened firefighters. In the dormitory, men off the line were treated for eye burn and smoke poisoning. In the kitchen, Bob Singleton set up a press center to accommodate the reporters, radio commentators, and TV newsreelmen. Battalion 5B to First Assistant Chief. Battalion 5B to First Assistant Chief. This is Chief Percy. Go ahead. I think we've saved all the homes in the Zuma Canyon area, but the fire has jumped the highway at Broad Beach and taken two big houses. Chief Anderson to Zuma Station. Go ahead, Harvey. Ramera Canyon's getting too hot to hold. Got to have 10 patrols to work around the houses right away. Okay, Harvey. Did you hear that, Chief? Yeah. Ramera goes, Escondido Canyon will be next. No doubt about it. Ask the Sheriff's Office to evacuate Escondido Canyon right away. Captain Sewell Griggers of the Sheriff's Aero Squadron has a bullhorn on his helicopter. He uses it to untangle traffic jams. This morning it is used for another purpose as he flies low and slow up Escondido Canyon. This is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office. Escondido Canyon is in fire danger. Persons still in the canyon are ordered to evacuate immediately. Now the fire was shaping into a disaster. As they had in two wars, the mobile canteens of the Salvation Army moved up close to the fire line. At the Webster School on Malibu Canyon Road, the Red Cross set up an evacuation center. And as the refugees poured in on foot, by automobile, and some even on horseback, the stories poured out. There was Mrs. Jean Hasselquist's narrow escape. We just uh, woke up around 5 o'clock by telephone call from a lovely neighbor, and uh, we looked up at the whole uh, hillside, and the mountain range was on fire. and. Uh, we were quite sure that we weren't going to be in the flames until the last minute when it leaped over the far uh, hillside there and all of a sudden the, hill was, the whole hill was just in mass of flames and we just ran for our lives. We uh, dismissed the flames by about 10 feet. By nightfall this first burning day, 900 men and 100 pieces of equipment were fighting a wholly uncontrolled fire. And 30 houses had burned to the ground, leaving nothing, ironically, but their stone chimneys and fireplaces. Among them was the beach house of TV star Ralph Edwards. Yes, we did have a lot of wonderful mementos in there, things that were very close to our hearts. But the ones I really feel sorry for are those people who lived on their land, who made their living out of the land, and to have their home go up in flames, that indeed was a tragedy. The second smoky dawn brings no relief as the fire roars on south toward Latigo Canyon. And here among the bright red fire engines is the blue and gray shortwave truck of radio station KNX and CBS News reporter Hugh McCoy. It looks as if we're trapped or at least temporarily stymied up here. Uh, the road has been blocked off by flames which just moments ago have leaped across the road up the side of the hill. Below here in the canyon, there is a house and a number of outbuildings which in just about a moment from now uh, will be uh, reached by those flames. And up here on the hill where the flames have jumped the road, another house, the greenhouse, is threatened. I don't think we can make a stand here much longer. Jim Lowe, our engineer, is about ready to evacuate with the KNX mobile unit. We've got to make our way back down this road. The heat is getting more and more intense, and the flames are swept over more than a half a mile of these mountains now, raging, moving very, very fast. The house I told you about a few moments ago down below here is completely enveloped in smoke and flames. The people, we have just learned, have been evacuated from that home. And up here to my right, another house which is still standing is threatened by these flames reaching 20 to 50 feet up into the air as these wind gusts whip the black pall of smoke. Now that's all from Latigo Canyon. We've got to make our way out. The engines are evacuating now. That afternoon along Highway 101, the citizens of Santa Maria and Santa Barbara, of Carpinteria and Oxnard knew something was up as a convoy of 18 civilian defense pumpers from Northern California roared south, red lights flashing, sirens screaming. Something indeed big was up as the engines from the north pulled into the Zuma fire station. The Malibu dispatcher in Agora. 
Go ahead. We have a reported fire in the Hume track. Hume track? Yes, sir. Just north of the sheriff's substation on Pacific Highway. It's traveling very fast. It's already taken several homes. Thank you. Chief. Yes, Roland. Just got a report of a blaze above the sheriff's station. Well, that's eight miles east of here. It must be a completely new fire. It's got to be. Order out every available piece of equipment in both the city and county. I'll take these civilian defense engines down there myself. A new fire, eight miles away, sweeping down the steep cliffside toward homes thickly clustered above the highway. Homes built high for the magnificent Pacific view. A view now obscured by ugly brown smoke choking out the setting sun, bringing an early night to this California Riviera. 4-0 Pacific Coast Highway. Mr. Height at this very moment is up on the roof with a hose wetting down his roof for directly across the street. These flames are roaring down the mountainside with a tremendous wind behind them and the firemen are on top of two apartments. While the others fight the fire house by house, and below, parked on the road, the householders and their cars, watching the smoke and fire blot out their homes, still gaily outlined in Christmas lights, and then pass on, leaving the homes and the lights intact as it roars on, insatiable to the west, toward the first fire, the Zuma fire, now contained, but not controlled. All over Southern California, the thoughts and sympathies of men of goodwill stretch toward the threatened people of the stricken area. And the thoughts and the sympathy and the prayers seemed not to have gone unheard. That night, the winds died down. The roaring red monster of flame flickered to a faltering standstill. Approximately one and a half miles northeast of Lake Sherwood, sweeping southwest from Ventura Boulevard on a three-mile front. A third fire. By noon, it has swallowed nine homes on the shore of Lake Sherwood and pushed by a 35-mile wind roars on toward the Zuma fire on the other side of the range. If it joins up with the Zuma burn, we've got it licked. The winds increase. Who knows? Right now, we know one thing. It's out of control. The sun sank that Friday evening behind the dirty brown cloud of smoke that stretched 50 miles from the San Fernando Valley across the mountains and over the ocean to Catalina Island. Sank red and angry, leaving behind its afterimage, a corona of fire atop the hills. And 2,000 weary men fought through that last long night. There was good news the next afternoon, qualified in the cautious words of a weary fire chief. We now have the fire tied up in a slippery knot. The knot held. And so did the Pacific High. As the evacuees returned to their homes, bizarrely colorful islands in the black and gray landscape, they looked up at the hot, cloudless sky and hoped it would stay that way. Now there was no fear of fire, but of flood. When the rains came and come they must, what would happen to their homes with no living vegetation in the hills to hold back the waters? Day after day, forestry department planes flew over the 26,000 acres of devastated mountains and hillsides, scattering a half a million pounds of ryegrass seed and the Pacific High held. And men ask, will the rains, when they come, come so heavily the seeds will wash away before they sprout? And men began filling sandbags and building dikes around their homes. And finally, the Pacific High weakened and broke, and the rains came. And once more, men prayed. It rained as it should have two months ago. It rained all day Friday, the 11th of January, all day Saturday, sometimes mercifully. And then, Sunday's dawn burst into a blue sky, lazy with the fleecy clouds that follow a storm. 
Yes, like a green fuzz across the gray hillsides, the ryegrass had sprouted and pushed its way through the cold ashes like a promise of springtime. There would be food now for the hungry deer in the high hills. There would be tiny roots now holding back the soil against the next rip in Malibu. Because man, who knows so well how to organize for his own destruction, had also learned how to war his own salvation.